26.2 miles, 55,334 steps, completed in as little as two hours for an elite athlete, or about four hours for the average runner. What does it take? Resilience, focus, strength, preparation, and faith. Finishing a marathon isn't just an athletic achievement. It's a state of mind that says, anything is possible. Jonathan Esquivel knows something about marathons, although the one he's been enduring since 2012 isn't a long run, but a challenge to survive, to remember, and to move. Serving on the San Antonio Police Force is an Esquivel family tradition. Jonathan's father, Robert, started in 1993 after retiring from the Air Force. His cousin is also with SAPD, and three other family members are retired officers. Soon after high school, Jonathan told his dad he wanted to go into the military or be a police officer. But I told him, you gotta remember, son, I didn't ask you to do this. It's something that you want to do because something ever happens to you, I don't want to take in the whole blame entirely. So that was our agreement. He'll never forget John's graduation from the academy. He was selected as the orator. He did an awesome job. He had us laughing, he had us crying. He had, I mean, it was great to see him do that. It was an honor. They worked together. So there was a lot of times I did cover him on calls. There was a lot of times he didn't know I, was too, I wasn't that far away. It was the best time of his life. The guys are, oh, here comes daddy and stuff like that, or here comes your baby, and it, 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 me and my son just laugh about it, you know, but, but it was very unique to be able to do that. Life was great for Jonathan, too. He had his dream job, a beautiful wife, and family. My two boys playing sports, I coach them. Um, they're wild like me, they're funny like me, so it was, it was just going great. He was also considering running a marathon. I know I can do that. So I just started running slowly, 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 and I was trying to get to where I can run a marathon sooner or later. So I was just increasing miles and miles and miles. In February of 2012, he was 28, working out every day and in the best shape of his life. He worked a lot of traffic collisions, but never worried about himself. I don't think police officers ever think of vehicle accidents. And that's the number one injury and cause of death of police officers. It was Sunday afternoon, February 19th. Jonathan was on duty. His dad was on vacation in Las Vegas. His boys were in Corpus Christi with his mom. And his wife, Marissa, had just left work. She called John to let him know she was headed to a meeting. He's telling me he's, he's got to go because he, um, he has to cover an officer who's handling an accident. And when he's saying this, I can hear that officer on the radio saying, I need somebody to help cover me. And so, okay, I'll let you go. At the scene of the crash on Loop 410 near Callahan, traffic was already backed up when Jonathan arrived. He was working to make the scene safer when a pickup going more than 50 miles an hour struck him. The driver didn't see him. He was texting. A few minutes later in Vegas, Robert's phone rang. It was his sergeant. I go, what's going on? He goes, it's John. I go, what's wrong with John? He says, he's been in, he's, uh, been in an accident. He tells himself, okay, it's probably not too bad. And then he goes, it's bad, Robert. And I go, what do you mean, Sarge? What do you mean it's bad? He goes, they don't know if he's going to make it. Marissa's phone rang, too. It was another officer's wife. She tells Marissa that her husband needs to talk to her. He gets on the phone, and he's like, has the, the police department tried to contact you? And I was like, no, I, no why? And he started saying, well, because uh, John was in an accident. It was too much to take. I started freaking out, and so I was like panicking. And then that's when my manager at the time, she grabbed my phone and she was like, who is it? And I was like, I don't know. 
They said John was in an accident. Her manager drove her to University Hospital, where trauma surgeon Dr. Daniel Dent was already leading the team caring for Jonathan. Well, we start always with the ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation, and uh, he clearly was not protecting his airway, so we uh, intubated him. Um, he also had drastically abnormal vital signs and oxygenation, so we put in uh, two chest tubes, one on each side of his chest. He was unconscious and in severe shock. That didn't solve his uh, instability uh, right away, so we did an ultrasound of his abdomen, uh, which was positive. Uh, suggesting there was some fluid in his abdomen, so we took him to the operating room. Thousands of miles away, Robert felt helpless. I remember I got on my knees, and I just got to save him. He called his daughter, who was with John's mother, Ori, in Corpus. As soon as she gets the call, she looks at me, and <laughs> I'm sorry. Hysterically, he starts screaming and says, Mom, Mom, it's John. She started throwing stuff in suitcases, loaded the car, and headed to San Antonio. And I was like, I didn't know how bad it was. I just didn't know. I, I just didn't want to think anything like, okay, he's, when I get there, he might be dead. I, I didn't want to think anything. Marissa made it to the hospital. I didn't really want to ask what happened because I knew it was bad. I just, by the reaction I got, it was, I knew it was really bad. She just prayed and waited. Robert was on a plane home. It was the longest three hours of his life. This is Paris Wars nightmare, you know. The flight attendant made an announcement to help him get off the plane quickly. And I'm running through the aisle and these people I don't even know are saying, we're gonna pray for him, we're gonna pray for him. When he saw all of the police officers at the gate, he thought the worst. He hugged his nephew. And I said, tell me he's alive. He said, yes, yes, but we gotta get you there quick. In the operating room, Dr. Dent and his team found extensive damage and a lot of bleeding. He had a bladder rupture, which our urologic colleagues uh, came in and fixed very quickly. But most of the bleeding was from the arteries, veins, and tissues in his crushed pelvis. Once they were able to get him more stable, they could get a better look. We went to CAT scan and then uh, found some of the bleeding in his pelvis. Metallic coils stemmed the bleeding. But Dr. Dent knew this was just the beginning of a very different type of marathon for Jonathan to endure. He was stable from a physiologic perspective, um, but at that point he still had a significant head injury, a cervical spine injury, a bad unstable pelvis that needed to be fixed, a bad ankle fracture that needed to be fixed. Um, he was on a ventilator and he needed to, and his urethra was transected and had not been fixed yet. The urinary drainage had just been temporized, so he had a whole lot of hurdles he needed to get over. I truly believe that that trauma team was awesome. And, and the other thing that the chaplain told me was, just don't pray for your son, pray for the doctors. Pray that God will give them the wisdom, the knowledge to do everything they need to do to save him. They were able to see him briefly as he was moved from the OR to the surgical trauma intensive care unit. His face looked just like he got punched and like his mouth was pretty swollen. So like, it, I mean, it looked like him, but it was just, he looked like he was in pain. Robert grabbed his hand. And I said, Pops is here, John. I was spreading his ear. I said, Pops is here. And he squeezed my hand. And that was enough for me. He had a cranial probe. He had a drain. I saw that he did have um, tubes. I, I was asking man, lots of questions. Dr. Dent gave them honest answers. He had a lot of significant injuries but no one was the one that was gonna take his life right then and there. So when that's the case, if there's not one that's foremost on my mind, then I just try to go head to toe. It was very bad, but he gave them hope. When you look at Officer Esquivel, you see a young, healthy guy who did not have dead neurons. He had a brain injury. He had a bony injury of his cervical spine, but his spinal cord did not appear to be transected. At the same time, he knew the risk of complications was significant. Blood clots and bed sores and urinary tract infections and pneumonias and wound infections and variety of complications that can come up uh, that, can, uh, that could be his undoing. Dr. Dent's team had consulted the orthopedic trauma team right away, and Dr. Ravi Karia's team did an initial evaluation. He had an absolutely awful injury but it wasn't something that needed to be taken care of that night. 
As Jonathan lay unconscious in the STICU and his family sat by his bed day and night, Dr. Karia was planning for a very big operation. And so for those two to three days, I was just going through in my head how I was going to attack it, how I was going to fix it, and what we may need to do and trying to get that plan together in my mind. It was the worst he's ever seen. And so what Jonathan broke was he broke that socket, which we call the acetabulum, along with his pelvis. And the, the socket was completely dissociated from the rest of the pelvis. And it's hard to say how many pieces it was in because there are too many to count. He knew it would take more plates and screws than he had ever used before. It's almost easy to think about how to get them back where they belong, but to hold them there is the hard part. He focused on the injury and the plan. He couldn't allow himself to think about Jonathan's family, all the police officers in the waiting room, or any of the news coverage. I did know his story. I knew exactly what happened to him. I knew he was out there helping people. He wasn't doing anything wrong. And I knew he had a, a life, you know, he had a wife, he had kids. And so absolutely that puts pressure on you. But um, in surgery, that's not something you can ever really think about. With everything ready to go, they took him into the OR. He was doing well, he was cleared by the teams. Anesthesia thought he was doing well. And when we got in there, within an hour, he just was bleeding a lot. Jonathan's body couldn't handle the stress. They decided to give him a couple more days to heal. They took him back three days later. It was a very long case. Fixed him through the front, um, and then we actually had to flip him on his belly and do a separate incision in the back to finish it up. He had good news to report to Jonathan's family. And we told them that you know, we're happy with how it went, and now it's really on him. Like Dr. Dent, he was worried about complications. In addition to the crushed bones, the skin below his hip had ripped away from the muscle. That sounds awful, and it is really awful. And so there's a big pocket under his skin between his muscle where fluid accumulates, and it's a very, very high risk for getting an infection. Over the next two months, Jonathan had more than 10 procedures. Preventing complication was everyone's priority. The fact that he never got infected was a huge victory for, for us and for him. But it wasn't easy. You know, I think our best ongoing support for our families is our nursing staff, uh, particularly in the surgical ICU. And we do have a chaplain, we have social workers, we have a lot of people, we have you know, a variety of physicians from all the different teams. But I really think the nursing staff are probably the key uh, in that regard. A blood drive for Jonathan was held at University Hospital. It broke the record set on 9-11. Chief McManus was there. You know, he even told Jonathan, they're blood brothers now. <laughs> He's got his blood in him. So uh, that blood drive was something else. We'll never forget that. Jonathan's brain injury was an ongoing concern. He was still in a coma. And they told us it would take time before they'd know how severe it was. We would just um, talk to him and I would hold his hand. Um, we would just tell him we love him. His dad would whisper in his ear. You gotta live for us and the boys. Since Jonathan wasn't awake, they really couldn't know if the injured nerves were working at all. The reason that's important is that if you don't know that early, you can't, you can't prescribe therapy to help prevent the complications from it. He was worried about too much bone growth around the injured hip. For some reason, when you have a bad head injury, the body, instead of healing that, those tissues with like tissues, you know, muscle or scar, it heals with bone. If they didn't keep moving John's hip, it would have gotten stiff and stuck in a certain position. There grew a lot of bone just in those places I was talking about, but since we had such, such great therapists that came and saw him all the time, they prevented him from getting that, a bad contracture. They did neuro checks daily. Ori remembers the day he first really showed signs of improving. Move your toes, John. And, and he started, we, you should, we, just, we were just in tears. I think in the back of my mind, I knew he was okay. I just knew it was gonna be a very long time to see my normal husband. Jonathan did improve, but not overnight. Well, there's a, when you're recovering from a traumatic brain injury, there's a long distance between not comatose and normal. His mental status, I mean, was way off. <laughs> you know, he'd, he'd holler out things and he had no sense of what he was saying. Jonathan has no memory of anything that happened the day he was hit or his stay at University Hospital. It's hard to believe, I mean, because 
Um, I feel like I actually, I, I didn't live it. I, you know, I didn't see it. I don't remember it. Even when he looks at photos. It's, it's weird. It's like, a, it's like a special effect in a movie. You know, it just wasn't me. It was a bad dream. Marissa didn't want the boys to see their father looking so bad. I just kept saying, you know, when he looks a little better, when he feels better, I, you know, you can see him. They finally did, about two months later. When we got there, they were like, Daddy! <laughs> they were excited, kind of scared too, though. And they just came running up to the bed, and I just started bawling. I, I was just crying my eyes out. Now that he was awake, the hard work was all on Jonathan, with a lot of help from his family. To really get back to just, just the basic on, that's my wife, th those are my, that's my family, these are my kids, and all that stuff takes some time to really kind of come back and, and, and re get just that first basic thing that all of us take for granted. He had to relearn everything. Rehab always focuses on the basics at first, like getting up, getting yourself to the bathroom, learning how to eat, putting on your clothes, and as each successive step gets passed, each next step is more complicated. And then it gets harder. So at first, you just have to stand, and you put so much effort into standing, and then you gotta remember how to walk, and you have to learn how to walk when your leg doesn't work the way it used to. I went through everything, they put me through the ringer. The one that I hated the most would have been uh, speech therapy, uh, trying to remember things. His mom remembers the time the therapist told him to write and send an email. I just sit behind him watching you know, his, they were doing it with him. And then um, at that time, he went in there and put in his password, put in his email, and then he sent a love note to Marissa. That took away a lot of her worry. Well, he's coming back. I thought, you know, mentally he's coming back. He left inpatient rehab in June. His son started football in July. I would go out there at least in the wheelchair and watch and, and yell, yell at the kids and try to coach them from the wheelchair. When he was home, he started off in a walker. And I never, I was like, okay, he'll depend on that for the rest of his life. I thought he would be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. So to see him actually walking, I mean, it's a really big deal for us. He was motivated by his boys. Whenever I got better, um, that's when I was able to help him out and start coaching again. He's a great father, he's a great husband, he's a great son, but all of that comes from him. And I've, I, I don't think I've, I've ever had a patient that's worked as hard as he has in his rehab. Exceeding expectations is a huge understatement. He's uh, in a way proved us wrong, and, and that's fueling his motivation. And so he's like, look at me now, I'm only gonna get better now. I think the first time he actually tried to run, we recorded it and we were like, oh my god, it was so exciting. <laughs> Sending me the video of when he first, when he first ran again, um, and it was it a pretty run? No, it wasn't, but he was, all he cared about was that he ran. They've presented his case at teaching conferences. They've all seen his x-rays, and so when he comes to clinic, no matter who's there, everyone has some knowledge of who this guy is before he gets there. And so we pop up the x-ray and I said, what do you, how do you think this guy is doing? And then they walk in the room and they're expecting to see a wheelchair. They're expecting to see at the minimum a cane. And he's just sitting there just with a big smile on his face, kind of walking in and out. He's still struggling with nerve damage. Cause I can't tell really what's hitting, well, what's going on. And so that is a really hard thing for him to overcome. He's back at work on light duty at SAPD. He's a photographer in the PIO office. It feels good to be working, and he enjoys the job. Will he ever run that marathon? He clearly has a lot of fight in him. Um, and to me, that's what uh, long distance running is, is about persistence. Oh yeah, we're gonna be right behind him. We'll be there cheering him on, of course. <laughs> I believe so. I haven't quit yet, not gonna quit. Uh, but at this point, after what he's shown, it's not going to be easy. It's not a 100% chance, but I mean, he hasn't shown any signs of quitting that I would be foolish to bet against him. Running a race would be an awesome accomplishment, but that's not really the finish line. I want to get back to the street. I want to, I want to throw on my uniform. I want to, you know, I want to um, go out there and solve problems. What does victory look like for Officer Jonathan Esquivel? I want to be able to to save the guy next to me if I have to.